All right, good morning. Welcome to Grand Rounds. We've got a few announcements to start with today. Uh, All Stars, if you've got your nominations, Dylan, we've gotten nothing from you in like two weeks, so um, send them to Tico. Please finish your uh, census. That email should still be in your uh, uh, in-basket from March 14th. Um, those who have not completed it will continue to get reminders. So uh, if you can't find that email, you will get another one. Um, quick research summary. Uh, Margaret Getz was the first author on a big group uh, published in Neurology Clinical Practice, looking at racial disparities in high value and low, va low value care at end of life for Medicare beneficiaries with Parkinson's and dementias. And uh, Birgit Frauscher was the first author of an article summarizing advances in EEG, ESI, and HFOs and EEG in critically ill patients. And in critical care medicine, a team of our ICU folks discussed sedation uh, choice in the mechanically ventilated patients with moderate to severe traumatic brain injury. There is your CME code. And we are going to jump right into our case for today to save some time. Uh, I'm going to introduce Dr. Nui Fan, who came to us from Penn State and deserves some big congratulations for just being accepted into the Neurologist in Training Clinical Ethics Elective at the AAN. So, get your slides up here. Okay. Go ahead. So I'm Nui, I'm one of the PGY2s. Uh, so my case presentation starts off with a 71-year-old female who had a history of cataract surgery that was replaced, but she's coming into the emergency department with acute, painless onset of blackening, complete blackening of her vision in just her left eye, and this happened at nighttime, and within two hours, full resolution. Um, she, her story is that at nighttime, she's reading on her Kindle, and then suddenly her left eye, she just lost vision in it, and she just went to sleep, and then when she woke up, she had full vision, but she came to the emergency room to get evaluated. She didn't have any headaches, no, no jaw claudication, but she had been experiencing, experiencing some low grade fevers, night sweat, cough, however she attributes this to a sickness that has been going on in her family. So when she came to, a, to us, her examination, she was already kind of back to normal. Like she had full vision, like cranial nerves. Pupils were four reactive to light bi bilaterally. Uh, visual field was full, no APD. And so the workup at that time um, was remarkable for some inflammatory markers that were elevated. CRP was 5.2, ESR was 40. Um, she didn't have any leukocytosis. Her neuroimaging, including CTA, MRI brain without, MRI brain with and without, and echo was unremarkable. And so her, uh, our initial thoughts was she was initially consulted by the stroke team. We thought maybe TIA considered aspirin and then discharge her. Um, and then we got room on board because her inflammatory markers were elevated. They thought this was GCA, and so they admitted her to medicine for treatment. And so she got three days of IV steroids, then transitioned to oral steroids, um, and then discharge. While she was here, her uh, temporal ultrasound was negative. And interestingly, during this time, the patient actually brought up a diagnosis that we never really heard of on the team. And what she brought up and what she thought she had was transient smartphone blindness. And so there's two reported cases in the New England Journal of Medicine uh, back in 2016. And it's two cases. It's a 22-year-old female and a 40-year-old female who had recurrent monocular painless vision loss. Um, with a 22-year-old, it occurred at nighttime. And the 40-year-old, it occurred upon awakening. And it only lasted 15 minutes for her each time it did happen. And so the clinical presentation of transient uh, smartphone blindness is that you have acute painless transient vision loss associated with smartphone usage, uh, usage. Typically when you're laying down and while you're uh, looking at your phone in the dark, symptoms occur only after several minutes of viewing uh, your smartphone and symptoms is always contralateral to the eye that you're lying on. And so what is causing this? So if you can imagine when you're going from a very bright environment into a dark theater, for example, initially you can't see anything. But after like a couple of minutes, even up to 35 minutes, your eyes start to kind of adapt uh, and starts becoming, you can see more things more clearly in the darkness. And so the pathophysiology that they uh, hypothesize for transient smartphone blindness is that people typically view their smartphones uh, with both eyes. However, when we're in the dark, we typically tend to lay on one side 
Um, and so you're having one side is kind of occluded, as they say, and the other eye is open and is perceiving that light. And so you have a differential retinal sensitivity between the two eye. And so the eye that is occluded becomes uh, dark adapted, adapted. And the eye that's viewing the phone kind of it's kind of bleached with all that light. And so when you turn off your phone, suddenly you're in the dark and that bright eye that's looking at the phone suddenly has to adapt very quickly. And as we'll talk about, rods that control dark adaptation takes longer uh, to reach full sensitivity for. And so adaptation, there's light and dark adaptation. Your cones, you have two photoreceptors, your cones and your rods. Your cone is responsible for light adaptation as well as day and dark color vision. Um, and this is described as your phototopic vision. You have your rods, which is your dark adaptation. It's also for night vision, your scotopic vision. And if you can see in the picture below, there's a luminescent range for which your cones are activated and then your rods are activated. And there's a middle zone called your mesotopic uh, area for which your rods and cones are activated. But to reach full maximal retinal sensitivity, it takes rods 30 to 35 minutes versus cone, which takes nine to 10 minutes. So if you could imagine, if that eye that's looking at the smartphone is just getting all this light signal and then suddenly you turn it off, it's gonna take a while until people can perceive that eye to be blind. Um, and that's kind of the, the hypothesis behind uh, transient smartphone blindness. And so the management of this condition is just advising patients to use their smartphone in well-lit room and to assure neither eye is occluded. And as you can imagine, acute painless monocular vision loss can be misinterpreted for a lot of other diagnoses, especially vascular, or inflammatory processes. And so it can lead to unnecessary intervention and therapy. And so what happened in this patient? Uh, when she was discharged, she did get a temporal artery biopsy that was negative. She followed up with ophthalmology and had had no recurrence since then. So the key takeaways is consider transient smartphone blindness as a potential cause of painless transient monocular vision impairment. I've never heard of this before. And so it was actually really cool. And so what's important to this is that there's no criteria. There's just a few cases. And so obtaining a history is very important. Uh, that's my presentation. My reference. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Next. Let's see if you have a laptop. Okay. And I'm now going to I'm going to invite up Dr. Peters to do the introduction of today's speaker. Good morning, everyone. Good morning, also for our um, our audience or our listeners, I guess, from that are online. And I'm I'm just delighted to have um, Dr. Somasen Gupta. She is actually coming for, to us from Chapel Hill, so just around the corner. Um, so welcome. Um, thank you for going down 15501. So um, she is a um, board specially certified neuro-oncologist and neurologist. Um, she's also fellowship trained in integrative medicine. Her clinical interests span the treatment of um, brain tumor patients and integrative approaches to neurology and neuro-oncology, as well as healthcare policy. She is now a full-time fa faculty member at um, UNC. Um, in Chapel Hill, where she's full professor and vice chair and chief of the Division of Neuro-Oncology. She completed her neurology residency at Beth Israel Deaconess Medical Center in Harvard, and then a clinical fellowship in neuro-oncology at Boston Children's Hospital and Dana-Farber Cancer Institute and Mass General, that's the partners program. And then, because she's going to talk to us about integrative medicine today in neuro-oncology, she did an integrative medicine fellowship at the Andrew Wheel Center for Integrative Medicine at the University of Arizona. So Dr. Singh Gupta, I'm so delighted you're here. Thank you for coming to talk to us. Firstly, I'd like to say um, thank you to Dr. Peters <laughs> and all of you for being here today. And thank you for the introduction, Dr. Peters. So I'm going to focus on integrative neuro-oncology today. And if there are, I'd, I'd like to declare my disclosures up front and talk a little bit about the division um, that I currently run. So in addition to the integrative um, oncology side, um, I have a translational wet lab uh, that has been funded in the past and I'm applying for funding in it. I do um, outreach work. Um, actually going to the Hill uh, for the National Brain Tumor so, Society, beginning of May. 
and I am heavily involved in clinical trials. Uh, I do clinical research and we sort of have multidisciplinary clinics. So this is a statistic, 71% um, of all brain tumors are benign and that's an NBTS um, statistic. So if they're benign, um, does it impact the quality of life? And the answer is yes. Um, you know, um, Dr. Peters and I are very familiar and we do a lot of work with our malignant brain tumor patients. <clears throat> and we need to remember that there are those that are suffering every day with different symptoms. So there are various integrative treatment strategies and currently I run a group integrative medicine um, visit that's on a virtual platform. I was trained by um, Don, uh, Don Abrams at UCSF. Um, he was part of the Andrew Wild Integrative Medicine Fellowship teaching instructors, if you like. But of course, he's known um, as being the chair of medical oncology at UCSF, and now um, he's in integrative oncology full time. So, in terms of integrative treatment strategies, there are many. Okay, so we can talk about ketogenic diet, we can talk about thymoquinone, we can talk about CBD. What do we really want to talk about? Okay. <clears throat> so let's talk about the ketogenic diet. Very busy slide, right? Um, when we look at the met uh, metabolic cycles, um, the TCA, um, where we're thinking really of the Warburg effect. Um, and aerob aerobic glycolysis um, is a characteristic of glioma cells and um, that to the proliferation of glioma cells. And so when glioma cells upregulate IGF-1 in response to circulating levels of glucose, um, that's uh, a huge problem because it promotes cellular growth. And so by changing the availability of metabolites um, and changing the substrate to ketones and fatty acids, the cells don't grow as rapidly. Um, and in kids, when I was at Boston Children's, um, we often had patients on ketogenic diets to lower seizure threshold. But one thing to bear in mind is tolerance. So over time, glioma cells can utilize ketones and adapt to do so over time. So ketogenic diets, calorie restricted, um, and in clinical studies uh, and trials, there's been about a 50% dropout rate. So when we had one um, that started off as a ketogenic diet at the University of Cincinnati, we, we ran into problems with this. Uh, my colleague, Dr. Chaudhry, then changed it to the modified Atkins diet, and others have since then. Um, and the diet has 75 to 80% fat in it. And if we think about stroke risk, stroke risk factors, cardiac risk factors, not great for most adults, right? Um, and it's as long as patients can maintain their circulating glucose and ketone levels within the so-called metabolic zone, then brain tumor growth hypothetically can be slowed down. And um, it's not, so in terms of how the ketogenic diet works, um, looking at systematic reviews published between 2005 and 2021. Um, this is a slide uh, from my mentor at the Andrew Weil, Liesel Schuller. Um, she saw that in nine studies, 67% um, of these were prospective, 22% had a control group. Um, average age of patients um, in the study was low um, and the age range was quite diverse. <laughs> And the duration ranged um, anywhere from three to 26 months. Um, and GBMs uh, were in 67% of these studies. And in all um, conventional treatment was used, all patients across all studies received radiation and TMZ. Um, and the um, ketogenic diet were used was not uniform. Uh, but the carbohydrate intake then varied from 20 to 50 grams per day and then fats also varied, um, and whether medium chain triglycerides were additionally given or not. Um, and then they didn't calorie restrict them either. So if you look at the data overall, because it's such a mishmash of things, 
um, there was actually no overall effect on survival. Um, and the mean overall survival was anywhere between um, 15, you know, from eight to 25 months. Um, and only 44% had an improved quality of life. And most patients complained of constipation, dysthenia, low blood sugars, weight loss, so they felt lightheaded, vomiting. Um, and if we look at the ERGO2 um, prospective randomized trial for calorie restricted ketogenic diet and fasting, um, in addition to re-irradiation re re from malignant glioma, um, it was the first randomized study. 50 patients were randomized to um, re-irradiation with um, a calorie unrestricted diet um, with the ketogenic um, diet sort of paradigm. And if we look to see what actually happened, four patients quit the trial before treatment and three patients stopped the ketogenic diet prematurely. Um, and only 17 patients developed ketosis at day six and the glucose levels declined considerably. And again, there was no difference in uh, progression-free survival and overall or overall survival. Um, but in a subset analysis, which was quite interesting, is if the patients had a glucose level of less than 83.5 mg per um, deciliter on day six, they significantly had a longer progression-free survival and overall survival. So that's an important um, thing to take from this. So in terms of short-term fasting and um, ketogenic diet in uh, recurrent gliomas, the study design was as follows. The randomization was one-to-one. -one. Um, and um, if we look at the numbers here, it's basically what I described earlier. And if we look at the, um, the sort of subset analysis as mentioned, if you have the average glucose um, within this range, patients actually did better. So do they really need to be a ke on a ketogenic diet for this? So that's a question to ask. And the, there are a lot of challenges. Um, you know, you've got all these side effects, you've got a uric acid accumulation, um, and the naturopaths actually use, use celery seed with a, a ketogenic diet to help with this. Um, but you can give allopurinol, um, kidney stones, you can use mag citrate um, or potassium citrate to kind of help with this. Hypercalciuria, you need to make sure that calcium intake is adequate. And constipation, you need to add fiber and probiotics. And an, an experienced nutritionist needs to work with you on these studies. So um, what I will say is um, there are several studies going on with the modified Atkins diet um, at Hopkins and other places. And that is definitely more tolerable. Uh, we did one at the University of Cincinnati with the modified Atkins diet. Um, and actually, there was no overall benefit either in our cohort of patients. Thymoquinone, um, those of you who are guide, uh, gardeners here know the flowers as um, nigella or lavender mist. Great um, in the garden, but you can harvest their seeds. Um, in Southeast Asian cooking, Asian cooking, they use the black cumin seeds um, in um, stir fries and other culinary things. But um, in Japan, um, they've used the thymoquinone in oil form um, to, suppress, uh, to suppress GBM uh, growth. And in, in vitro and in animal models, it'll reduce apoptosis in GBM and medulloblastoma cells. And the signaling pathways it deploys is NF-kappa-beta and interleukin-8. Um, it's synergistic with TMZ and with radiation. So if you have an unmethylated, MTMT unmethylated patient, you can actually do this. Typical dosing is 1,000 milligrams twice daily, um, but you should start at a lower dose, 500 milligrams twice daily for one to two weeks. Um, it's been studied in humans um, not to affect baseline coagulation and can help uh, prevent blood clots, actually. Um, but thymoquinone has poor bioavailability, and currently my cells and nanoparticle forms are in development. And importantly, you need to know that it does induce certain um, 
CYPs. Um, so any drugs um, that go in the pathway, you have to um, basically consult your pharmacist to make sure that you, you don't have a drug drug cross reactivity. <clears throat> so ginkgo, we have a lot of ginkgo biloba trees around. Um, so phase two trials were um, studied in uh, primary brain tumor patients for approximately six months after whole brain or partial brain radi irradiation. And they used 40 milligrams of ginkgo biloba three times daily for tw 24 weeks. And then there was a six week washout. Um, and then patients with their own controls baseline versus treatment. And they looked at executive function, attention, concentration, nonverbal memory, mood, quality of life. But only 56% of these patients completed 24 weeks. The main thing was GI toxicity and some patients had intracranial bleeding. So um, you, I, I would say there are significant toxicities here. Now this is a big one, um, cannabinoids and gliomas. And um, the number of um, you know, patients that will ask about this is huge. I'm sure you'll agree, Dr. Pikus. <laughs> so um, cannabis contains um, tetrahydrocannabinol, cannabinol, and cannabidiol. Um, and what's interesting is um, THC binds to the CB1 receptors, which are particularly abundant in the brain, uh, whereas C um, CBD binds to CB2 which is expressed in the immune system. And although glioma cells express both CB1 and CB2, high-grade gliomas express more CB2. And cannabinoids in some of the Spanish studies, Australian studies, um, inhibit proliferation and geogenesis in many animal models. Um, so a 2014 system, uh, system, um, systematic review included 35 studies um, 34 in vivo and then one in vitro and one pilot study. Um, and um, what they found that there was a reduction in tumor size, um, angiogenesis properties and anti-metastatic effects and healthy cells were unaffected. Would be great to run studies with this, but there are huge issues with um, different states and the legal, uh, legal um, premises with this. Uh, so, um, and what's interesting for me is from a palliative care sense, trying to do symptom management, the cannabinoids are usually much better tolerated in our glioma patients than the opioids are, yet it's easier to get the opioids for them than the cannabinoids. And mechanistically, there are over 100 phytocannabinoids in cannabis sativa, and um, collectively, they um, exert the cytotoxic antiproliferative effect. And um, many patients choose um, to use the cannabinoids. And I was trained to use them uh, for patients, but in, in both Ohio and in North Carolina, I'm not allowed to prescribe. So I often will refer my patients to um, groups or wherever that they can get the products they want. But if we look at the various signaling mechanisms, it's actually pretty interesting how they work through a lot of the different pathways. So THC, pilot clinical study of nine patients with recurrent GBM found that intratumorally inject injected THC was safe without um, overt psychotropic effects um, and anti-proliferative effects were noted in post-treatment biopsies in two of the nine patients. CBD, um, rich extracts can reduce pain, improve appetite, lessen agitation, improve sleep, and are associated with control of cancer. Um, there are many sources of CBD-only supplements um, derived from hemp oil, which can be sold without prescription in the US. Uh, for the anti-cancer effects, in addition to mood stabilizing, pain relief and relaxation, typical dose should be between 10 to 50 milligrams of CBD. Um, in terms of phase two clinical trials, um, the THC-CBD mixture in combination with dose um, intense TMZ in 21 GBM patients. Um, patients received orally a maximum of 12 sprays. This is an Australian study. Um, and the control group received TMZ alone. 
um, survival rates, um, the numbers, um, they actually, um, the THC CBD group in T with um, TMZ did better in this Australian study. Um, and the most common adverse effect was um, vomiting, dizziness, nausea, headache, and constipation. So um, also patients will come in and ask about homeopathy. So this is a supplement that I don't mind them having. Um, and it, this was an observational study done um, in 15 patients. Um, six of the seven glioma patients showed regression of tumors over a period of three months to seven years. And these are the kind of things that patients will bring you, uh, you know, that they will research. And both in vivo and vitro results showed induction of survival signaling pathways. And this, the typical dosing is um, pretty low. Who's to say this study has not been replicated? So the problem with studies is the standardization of them and trials, the same thing, standardization. When we design trials uh, within the US, we have strict parameters as in certain part and other parts of the world. But some areas um, of the world, they don't have these um, strict parameters and guidelines in place. So I, when I talk to patients, I explain to them that yes, you know, this is an interesting study, but it's not been reproducible. So melatonin, so sleep is a huge um, issue with brain tumor patients and many um, uh, patients with neurological disorders. And melatonin, as we know, is um, synthesized from L-tryptophan uh, in enterocytes and by the pineal gland. Um, and, you know, there's been um, in vitro work predominantly um, showing inhibition of Glioma growth, um, and basically mel melatonin reduces monocyte chemoattractant factors, and it downregulates oncogene expression and upregulates tumor suppressor genes through a HIF1 alpha dependent pathway. And the sedative effects at night can be beneficial for patients with agitation and insomnia, but too much melatonin can make the patients pretty groggy. Um, could it improve radiation efficacy? Um, there have been some studies done, but it needs to be um, done on a larger scale. Um, and there have been sort of reports about it um, decreasing drug resistance in stem cells, and particularly cancer stem cells. Um, so I tend to go on the lower dose end, um, five milligrams before bedtime, um, and I usually tell my patients to take it at least an hour before. Um, but many um, providers, <clears throat> excuse me, will give um, up to 20 milligrams. Vitamin D, another topical one across neurological diseases, why should gliomas or brain tumors be any different? Um, so glioma cells express vitamin D receptors. And when vitamin D binds to these receptors, apoptotic pathways um, in um, vitro and in animal models are stimulated in glioma cells. Um, and vitamin D3 receptor expression is associated with improved overall survival in GBM, according to certain studies. Um, and then um, the sort of um, BDRSNP associated with an increased risk of um, meningioma, so same pathway. Um, and supplementation, you want to get 40 to 80 nanograms per mil a day in a patient. This is a topical one, um, and in fact, uh, Josh Palmer at Ohio State um, and other groups, um, including mine, are looking at the use of Boswellia serrata um, and Bos uh, Boswellia uh, serulata in um, brain med patients, and, in G um, and the studies have been done in Germany um, by a group in Heidelberg um, on in, G in GBMs and gliomas to decrease edema. As we all know, um, dexamethasone, um, which we use uh, for um, controlling edema, causes a lot of different side effects, whereas Boswellia uh, doesn't really have as many. So to find something that could help control the edema would be great. The issue is the, uh, the um, formulation. So 
the current formulations require 4,200 milligrams of boswellia because the active ingredient is known as ACPA, A-K-B-A. Um, and there's one company called MCS that does formulate um, the ACPA formulation, so patients don't have to take such a huge dose. Um, the boswellia also su uh, supports uh, brain cell recovery from injury, and typical dosing can range from 800 to 2,400 mix per day, if it's the uh, other formulations I talked about. ACPA is different. Um, you can go up with a much lower dose. Another one that patients will ask you about and then you know, say that they're taking lots of this with black pepper is curcumin. Um, so what's interesting, a component of curcumin, which is um, DMC, was found to be um, superior to T uh, TMZ in its ability to inhibit proliferation by inhibition of the STAT3 proliferation, proliferation pathway. Um, and it prolongs survival time in athymic uh, mice uh, bearing orthotopic intracranial GBMs. And there was a reduction of um, the tumor size. Issue is bioavailability. So trying to get the right form of procurement is critical. Um, and you need to use something that's in a micellar form if a patient wants to take it. So something like theracumin um, would be the way to go, and that's two capsules, 60 milligrams of two capsules. Berberin, uh, used in a lot of Middle, Middle Eastern cuisine, um, might enhance effects of ECNU in the treatment of malignant brain tumors, can sensitize glioma cells, uh, but not normal um, glial cells to radiation. Um, it induces G1 arrest and apoptosis in GBM through the mTOR pathway. It can also induce apoptosis <coughs> secondary to um, ROS generation. Um, it can decrease survival and protein time and induce cell death by downregulating the EGFR MEC ERK signaling pathway. Has this been done in patients in a trial? The answer is no. Um, typical dosing is 500 milligrams three times a day and it can cause um, GI tract um, issues. So supplements to avoid, um, high dose glutamine, fuel, it's an alternative fuel for gliomas. Inositol, um, it's a regulator of angiogenesis and invasion. Lion's mane, so um, that's an interesting mushroom. It can increase the growth of CNS tumors by increasing BDNF. Um, serotonin, and SSRIs or supplements that increase serotonin um, levels are best avoided. And of course, um, Dr. Randazzo, who was here, um, looked at aspects of mindfulness. And I know that her intent was to do a prospective study in the long run in this. Uh, but in the retrospective review of um, spiritual healing and prayer meditation, um, it didn't um, seem to correlate with the quality of life in brain tumor um, patient populations. But um, Dr. Randazzo felt that it was a retrospective uh, study, so she wanted to do it um, prospectively. She also looked at a feasibility study to um, look at mindfulness meditation practices during chemo radiation of high-grade glioma. And I do want to give her a shout out because she was kind of one of the um, most amazing um, neurologists and um, did a lot of work for her patients. So in terms of exercise, um, um, Milbury et al. Um, did uh, do a yoga program for high grade gliomas, um, undergoing radiotherapy uh, for patients and caregivers. So we're now shifting not only to patients, but the caregivers to try and imp uh, improve their burnout so that they can take care of their families better. And there's preliminary data to suggest that it improves the quality of life. And then there's an exercise intervention uh, for high-grade glioma patients also seem to show benefit. And exercise um, in cancer patients in general has been shown um, to uh, improve um, in terms of quality of life. Turning to nature, so I had a very interesting case at um, when I was at UC in Cincinnati Children's, where 
had a patient, we could not get insurance to uh, approve any platelet stimulating agent. So um, I went back in the literature, looked at the dengue fever literature, and found that they were using a papaya leaf extract in Asia. And um, we were able to reuse, uh, reverse, sorry, chemotherapy-induced uh, thrombocytopenia in one of our GBM patients. So um, this is something that I'm interested in and will be studying further. The other thing I do, I did mention clinical research projects. And um, when I was at the University of Cincinnati, I collaborated with um, the Associate Dean of Research at the School um, of Design, Architecture, Art, and Planning. Um, her name was... Um, uh, her name, rather, is Dr. Claudia Rabolin. I'm still collaborating with her. And we designed um, digital apps, and we've just completed the studies. So we're writing them up right now, um, on active versus receptive music listening therapy in breast cancer patients. So most music therapy is listening to music. Here we created um, sounds for the patients to be able to compose their own music. And um, we know that, you know, Breast cancer is a common um, cancer. Um, survival rate is high, and there's a lot of issues with chemo brain. Um, so fogginess, not being able to perform as well. And previous studies show efficacy of music therapy in neurodiseases. Um, and so, as somebody who's um, very fond of music, I was like, okay, and you know, sang and played an instrument. I was like, well, you know. It's good to learn how to play, but you can't ask somebody who's going through a disease treatment to suddenly pick an, up an instrument and do it. So what we did was we had this um, study where we, um, we accrued patients and randomized. Uh, we began, um, we did the fact cog um, intervention and then an MRI scan at the beginning to make sure that they didn't have brain mats. Um, and then um, we did a fact cog analysis midway and at the end of the study. And one of the things we did want to do was um, do fMRI with this, but unfortunately the researcher we were working with left for Stanford so we couldn't do the imaging part of this. Um, and we had patients that were 20 and older and um, didn't have a history of mental illness um, and also no phobia to MRI machines and that they could hear because obviously it was a music study, so we needed them to be able to hear. And in terms of, um, you know, the conclusion, we were um, wondering about poor long-term neurocognitive outcomes with little knowledge about music-based therapy. And, um, you know, we wanted to offer executive function and improvement and that we had this pilot data to design a larger trial through epoch Akron. And um, we had a MOCA of at least 22, and patients needed to have internet access. And so this is what it looked like. You had basically an iPad, and the app was um, put, uh, keyed into it, and they had to put their participant number and tell us what, the, what they felt like with smiley faces. And um, we looked to see what happened with um, active versus passive music listening. And so um, what, we, um, what we found um, with our group of patients, actually, the patients who um, did the expressive music, so made their own music, did better than the ones that did not. Um, and so, as I say, we're writing it up um, and going for further funding right now. Um, and in terms of the interface, so I just completed graduate certification of um, AI in healthcare. Um, through MIT, and um, you know this in, in, this interaction between the AI application, digital technology is um, is coming to the forefront um, in the in the neurosciences. So, we designed a series of different apps for our cancer patients. So we have the music, we have an art therapy tool. We, um, uh, my colleague Dr. Robola has worked with the uh, pet companion, and we also did a narrative tool which is interfaced with AI. Um, and in terms of our original funding for our art therapy tool, uh, we 
use vestibular schwannoma patients because we were funded by a uh, philanthropist um, whose wife was affected by vestibular schwannoma. And we've now completed both of these studies, so the status is now that they're both finished. And I've received um, further funding with the group that I work with to um, uh, develop the art therapy tool further for cancer, so young adult cancer survivors. So we're going to be opening that study up at UNC. Um, so the art therapy intervention, it's a 12-week tablet-based digital art therapy program. Um, and um, the, the initial study uh, required physical um, kits, um, and there were self-directed weekly um, art activities, and then the patient had to take a picture, and then there was a post-study virtual visit with a licensed art therapist. And we wanted to see whether it improved the quality of life uh, and mood issues. Um, and this study we combined with um, a pet robot as well, and the pet had a, um, you know, a smart bandana um, so that it sensed when patients were interacting with it, and we did weekly phone calls. And um, since this was beta testing the app, we had five patients receiving the art therapies alone, five um, receiving the combination, and we did a handy and um, quality of life survey. And this took off in terms of publicity. People were very interested in our approaches. Um, and what's happened since then is we finished this study, again, writing it up. Um, and we're actually um, working with an AI expert at the University of Cincinnati, who's also part of the Siemens um, network. Um, and we're developing the art therapy work further for submission in the NIH platform. In terms of support groups, I think these are very crucial. And um, so the virtual group visits that I do um, help support um, the patients with the integrative health. Um, and in addition, um, they help the brain tumor patients uh, find support with each other. Um, that's my little flyer. And these are the people that I have to thank profusely for my integrative medicine training um, and a while Lisa Schuler, who continues to be a mentor, and we continue to write together. John Abrams, who again is a mentor, and we do quite a lot together. And um, you know, a lot of the app studies were done with uh, foundation funds, the so Jijurika and Schiff Foundation, and the UNC study um, that I will be doing is the Ian's Friends Foundation um, that has funded it. So with that, I'd like to say thank you and um, ask if there are any questions. So what I do is, this is why I have the group visits, and in the group visits, I always have breakout rooms. So um, what I do is then um, do like one-to-one -one consultation regarding the herbs and supplements and everything they're taking, what they could continue to take versus not. And we also had one of the um, assistant deans at the School of Pharmacy, it's integrative medicine trained at UNC. So I bounce ideas off her as well. So really try to tease out to give the whole package to the patient. Um, but I don't try to do it within my neuro oncology visits because otherwise it becomes a, there's no time. And so when, if they want to go down this route, then we do that. And it's interesting with my first series because um, the series started around January and this is now the second series of these visits. I have people from the first series that come back because they, they find it beneficial 
um, and they want to discuss more things and you know, because they want, they're trying everything they possibly can. So that's the way I tackle it. Yes, so um, glutamine um, was one of them. Um, you know, the, and then lion's mane mushrooms, there's conflicting. Um, so I didn't talk about the mushrooms here because it's a whole other area, like psilocybin and things like that. Um, and those are things that I'm interested in, looking at the effect of psilocybin on mood, um, because it's a one-time dose only. Um, but trying to get it in the state would be hard. Um, but lion's mane mushrooms, um, they can they stimulate the BDNF pathway, and that could potentially propagate um, growth. But there are extracts available of lion's mane where you can tease the properties out. So that's the other thing. And then um, breast cancer patients. So there's a person called Paul Stamets. Um, and Paul, um, when his mother had, um, triple, um, had breast cancer, metastatic disease, um, and she was in the older patient population, she was told to go on home hospice. Paul um, put her, uh, his mom on turkey kale, uh, kale mushroom uh, extract and she's still going strong. So there's a whole body of stuff out there that we don't know. And so I'm very cautious about how I, you know, I won't poo poo anything. I'll read up about it and come back to the patient. Or um, for example, the one that had the low platelets you know, we couldn't get Promacta. And what I realized was when I looked um, and I called the company up, I looked at the active ingredients, they were actually using one of the extracts from papaya leaf within the Promacta. So, and charging a whole lot more than a few dollars. So, um, and the patient did well. I mean, he was able to tolerate his TMZ and finished his treatment. So I think sometimes we do have to look out of the box So there's mixed um, uh, mixed uh, messaging there because some of them, like Prozac, have been used in clinical trials. But if you notice, um, uh, because of the cancer neuroscience mesh, and part of my work, a lab actually works in that area. So the wet lab stuff, that's what we do. Um, and what I would say is that there isn't enough data to show that these drugs are actually working. And in the patients that are on these um, antidepressants, um, their quality of life might not be great to begin with. So you don't really know whether it's actually the simulation of these pathways versus they have a poor quality of life and they're not, there's a compliance issue. So these smaller studies don't look at the compliance effect. So UCSF, um, they have looked at uh, things like that. So um, Prozac is one that um, is um, beneficial, but some of the, um, you know, some of the other ones are, are not as beneficial. So uh, we tend to go more for Prozac in aglioma patients for that reason. The other drug, which is not in the SSRI subclass, but um, the West Coast groups have looked at it and are looking at is um, gabapentin and the use of that. Um, but there really needs to be more analysis of the clinical data and the clinical informatic sets uh, by interrogating AI platforms like XQS to see whether there is, in fact, a real difference or not.
I integrate that. So um, one of my mentors who knows very well is David Reardon. And, uh, David uh, was here many years ago, and he was very much um, into nutrition. So um, with my patients, um, I tend to um, advocate for a Mediterranean diet. Uh, Plant-based diets are usually hard to do if they're not vegetarian or vegan to begin with. Um, and then the other thing I do is if they want to go ketogenic route, I, I recommend a modified Atkins diet because I just think um, the other risk factors that are involved with cardiovascular risk and all of that, I, I, I just find it's very difficult for patients to do with a, when they're undergoing radiation chemotherapy. So, and I tell them that you know if you maintain your sugars at a low level, you're more likely to do better. Um, anecdotally, I found that my patients who've done very well, including one that I'm supposed to, um, I have patients now that I've dealt with 15 years out and things like that who have been very strict about their diet, their trials, and also um, the supplements they use. So there is something to be said about somebody who really takes care of themselves. So if they want to spend that time to communicate about that, I'm, I'm fine with it. Um, but then you know you are up against a system as a as somebody who's also an MBA. I know the cost, right? The healthcare cost. How much time do you spend per visit? Because it takes a lot of time to go through all of this. So this is why um, I do offer the virtual um, group visits so that patients can do that in a cost-effective manner. Uh, they build at a level one, so it's not uh, breaking their accounts. Um, and at the same time, um, it addresses their questions and they're supported by other people doing similar things. So that's an, uh, a very interesting question. The answer is there's no study that has been done. But in my patient population, I've not had that issue. So I had uh, a medulloblastoma patient come to me from um, who was just on vitamin C infusions. And he literally saw, he was from a different state, sought me out. Um, and we did a whole thing on, on standard of care and adding in integrative uh, things. And he doing very well. So I think the thing is, it's listening to the patient, it's that communication, and really taking a step back and saying, what is, what, 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 you know, what do they want? What is the consumer brand? We don't do this uh, as physicians, because that's not something we're taught to do. And so we're like, this is the evidence base, these are the trials, this is data. And the patient is like, well, you know, my, my friend was, you know, is telling me about this or my so-and-so is telling me about that. You know, so I, I, don't, I don't like dismissing that and same token, the trials and studies, I do the same thing. I'll say that, look, this is a trial. You know, it's up to you to take a couple of days with that consent form and think about it. I'm not going to put you in, in a kind of situation where you have to make a decision right away. So that's the thing, and, um, and Dr. Peters know, knows this because we do the same kind of thing, which is we will, um, you know, if she has a trial that's open, that's better for my patients, I would send, her the, uh, send the patient that way. This engenders trust. If your patient realizes that you're looking out for them and not yourself, it goes a long way. So I, yeah, yeah. And so, you know, cancer centers of America and places like that will offer these high dose infusions. And I say, it's not going to harm you, but you're going to, um, you've just got to realize that you might form kidney stones 
the other thing is what your body is not absorbing, you're peeing out. And um, we don't have studies to show how much we're actually excreting through these infusions. But if you want to do it, I'm okay with it, but don't do it during, during radiation because otherwise you're countering the effect. Thank you very much.